Thank you for bearing with us through lunch. Now, there's always a real danger after lunch. You know what it is. Some of us take a little nap. So, but, but you might miss what God sent you here for. Uh, I want to ask you to do something with me. If Marty can go back to the slide, please, uh, of the prayer to the Holy Spirit. We'll get there just in a second. Oh, and, I, and I forgot to say thank you to Marty. Wow. I sent her all these notes, and they were just jumbled up. And she, just, she's, she always helps me out. Would you join with me and let us pray the prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O oh God who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you. And if we pray that and mean that, trust me, God is able. God is faithful. And Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Thanks be to God. Uh, we, we get to the point in this uh, conference uh, that has the possibility of becoming a little bit uh, challenging. Let's just say it like that. Uh, we, we now have understood that God has something big for us in this world, in this life we live. I should have said earlier, there's not a single person here who's an accident. Uh, you're here because God uh, ordained you to be His daughter, His son. You're here because He called you by the Holy Spirit. Uh, God has something big for every person here. You're not just spinning your wheels through life. God has something big for you. And we know that now that we can't do it on our own, but we know who the Holy Spirit is. He is the very presence, power. He is God in us. We also know that the Holy Spirit is not just one of the gifts. He is the gift to us. And now we're to the point where we want to talk a little bit about the manifestations of those of that spirit, uh, it's it's very clear that Methodist and our sisters and brothers of other uh, traditions have always understood that when the Holy Spirit falls, is poured out, there is a human response to that. Always a human response. So in this lesson, what happens when the Spirit is poured out? I want to share with you Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. And the Word says, I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power. Power through His Spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in the 19th verse. 
Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Now, as I start this, let me just say quickly, uh, I've been asked by several people uh, during lunch break, not for me to slow down, you know that's hopeless now, but uh, by several people, if we could make these notes available that you see on the screen, I hadn't even thought about that. But that is possible, I think. Uh, I know nothing about electronic stuff. Amy does all of that. But my, uh, my thought is that we will put those on the, on the web page in a PDF file. Can we do that, Amy? You look at me like I don't know what you're talking about. But we'll, we'll find a way to put this somewhere where you can get to that. And, and we will have those up because I realize some folks may have missed a couple. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Uh, again, Bishop James Swanson said the greatest danger in the church is trying to lead without God. The greatest danger in the church is trying to lead without God. The Holy Spirit is God at work in us. Therefore, we come to the part of this teaching that I guess stirs up the most curiosity of folks uh, who would take a Holy Spirit course, and they really want to know what their pastor, what the, their teacher, what their district superintendent actually believes about these gifts. Do you really believe these gifts are operational in the day and age that we live. Now probably some of you are anxiously awaiting to hear that. And the debate, debate comes down basically on two sides. This is highly technical, and I don't do much technical stuff. Uh, I just want to make sure I can enunciate the words before I, I start. But it's made up of basically two, two schools of thought. The cessationists, uh, those that believe that the gifts have ceased after the first century, and the continuationist, those who believe that miracles, signs, and wonders, and the gifts are operational in our day and time. The cessationist will argue that the purpose of the gifts was twofold. Number one, the physical manifestations were intended to create apostolic order. In other words, if these 11 guys who had no credentials other than following Jesus around in the wilderness for three years. How would they take authority over this thing called the church? So the cessationists believe that what actually happened was that the Holy Spirit was given to the 11 apostles, maybe 12 since they got the other one. Now, you ever notice that's the first act of business they did after Pentecost? They called a meeting? couldn't help but believe. They had to fill that void on their administrative board. So, so here's... Some of you are living with me on that one. But, but uh, they, they believe that these gifts were given only to those or those in the first century who were leaders of the church to give them credibility. Also, they believe the miracles, the signs, and the wonders were given uh, to create uh, authority from the biblical message or in the canon of Scripture, the canon of authority. So it was, it was all to help convince people. And, and therefore, at the end of the first century, the apostles are dead. The church is moving well. Everyone accepts now that Jesus is resurrected. He's the Lord of the church. And, and they accept the fact that the Scripture is the Word of God. Therefore, there is no longer a need for miracles, signs, and wonders. Their purpose was completed. The gifts of the Spirit 
ceased at the end of the apostolic age. That's sad. <laughs> because I say, if that happened, why not I even pray? Why not, you know, why not I seek God? Uh, I got a feeling if uh, pastors, some of your parishioners are in the hospital, and you go to pray with them, and you pray, well, I, Lord, I'd like to pray for healing, but you stopped your signs and wonders at the end of the first century, so I just don't really know what to pray. May it all work out, in Jesus' name, amen. I, I would be the most conflicted person in the world if I believed that the gifts had ceased. So I, I guess you would say I'm a continuationist. This group believes that the gifts continue even until this very day. And the purpose for the gifts were to be a sign of the coming kingdom. Uh, it was a, it's signs that testify to the very power of God among uh, the witnesses here. Uh, yes, we're living in the last days, but at the same time, we have a lot of work to do because not everybody is going to believe has believed yet. So the, the works and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the gifts, is still active among us and, and available to us. Now, now, most of us in this room will testify to the fact that we st still believe miracles happen. Uh, if, if miracles do not happen, some of us are going to find it very hard to figure out how we become a Christian. However, with that being said, I I'm going to press you on, on what the understanding is that we believe about the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, yes, they're still active, but some of those must just be reserved for those other folk, those other people. That doesn't happen in my church. But, but with that said, I need to give you some guidelines on the gifts. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, and I was questioned about the quadrilateral, uh, it is very much abused. But the gifts of spiritual, the story of spiritual gifts has the same ending. Uh, the gifts are not necessarily gifts for life. Gifts are for specific situations. Uh, now I know that flies in the face of some of our televangelists, but. But I respect Nicky Gumbel a lot as he's led uh, a total revival of the Church of England or the Anglican Church, which was dead as the proverbial uh, doorknob. And he has led a tremendous movement in the Anglican Church in, in England that has brought to life what once was dead. And, and he was talking about the spiritual gifts, and he, he was trying to share that gifts are given for a purpose. Uh, and, and the purpose is simply to witness to the power of God. And, and he said the person in his church that he perceived had the greatest gift of healing of anyone he had ever seen in all of his life, and he had never met Benny Hinn. We'll talk about that later. But uh, he, he said this person who had the great gift of healing, in, in 25 years, the gift of healing had been activated in his ministry three times. Duh. It's not like, I, get the, I got the gift of healing, y'all come down here and I'll show you something. Uh, What's happened with the gifts, I'm afraid, in the church, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we have actually turned that over to a group of charlatans and showmen. 
And, and the reason that the, the gifts are not practiced in operation in the church today is we have forfeited what God ordained us to be doing with them. And we said, we don't want to touch them. Let's let somebody else have it. And unfortunately, some of the places we've given the authority to have abused the gifts. Gifts of the Holy Spirit always point to God and never to the individual. Uh, the, the gifts, uh, they, they are given for the purpose of witnessing. Remember, you'll be my witnesses. The purpose of witnessing to the good name of Jesus. So folks will come to know Him. Now, the, the single evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's what you want to hear. Please hear me carefully. Uh, I do not believe there is one single gift that reflects the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But collectively, the one thing that gives credence and testifies the evidence of being Spirit-filled is power. That's what the Scripture teaches. That we will be endued with power. Now, the, the Holy Spirit, I, I, I do not believe He is divided up in 12, 13, maybe 14 different gifts and just says, well, uh, Lord Jesus, give me the gift of prophecy. Lord Jesus, give me the gift of tongues. Lord Jesus, give me the, give, give me the gift of healing. Give me the gift of giving. Anybody ever pray for the gift of giving? Lord, give me the gift of service or helps or hospitality. Or the word of knowledge. All these are gifts. But my understanding is that when we come to pray, we pray for the gift. And the gift is the Holy Spirit. And when we receive the gift, then the, the Holy Spirit applies to us those functional gifts that we need to live out the call that God has placed on our lives. Now, so, I, I know this flies in the face of a lot of teaching, but the gift of tongues is not the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's only one of the evidences, not the only evidence. The gift is the Holy Spirit. Our call is very clear. We are to seek the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, then allow the Holy Spirit to dispense the appropriate needed gifts for the ministries that you and I are called to. What a tragedy uh, when we run after and seek the gift instead of the giver of the gift. I had a, an uncle and an aunt several years ago. They got in some financial trouble, about to lose everything, and they thought, you know, I, we may need some help here. So desperation will send you to do desperate things. So they lived in Georgia, and I remember them telling my parents, that we're after the Holy Ghost. We believe the Holy Ghost is what we need, and we're going to every camp meeting till we get Him. As far as I know, they died without Him. But what they were after was not the Holy Spirit. They were after the gift that come from being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the gifts are important. Please do not minimize that. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit has two powerful elements, and I've shared this with you earlier, the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. These two come in a complete package. They're not either or. It's not, okay, I think I'll take the gifts of the Spirit or I'll take the fruit of the Spirit. They come together, and this is what I want you to hear about that. The fruit of the Spirit creates the character of Jesus in us. It could be really dangerous to have the gifts of the Spirit without the character of Jesus. You see how we would abuse those or attempt to? So the fruit of the Spirit creates the character of Jesus in us, and the gifts of the Spirit creates the ministry of Jesus through us. 
They are both important. Both come as a result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. One is transformational. One is missional. Transformation makes us like Jesus. Missional helps us to carry His mission to the world. The Holy Spirit gives the power to live a life of complete obedience. It creates in us a new capacity to choose the fullness of Jesus. The capacity for being those new creations in Christ Jesus. To live lives of holiness under the fruit of the Christian life. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to proclaim the gospel in a language that the people can hear. Empowered with gift-based ministry. This actually does the work and ministry of Jesus in the present age. But please hear this warning. These works and these gifts are not for personal edification for any preacher, any lay servant, any church, any denomination. Uh, the edification goes to the giver of the gift. And the, and the purpose is the whole body and the kingdom increases. In other words, my gift is given for the edification of the entire church, not me. I remember one night years ago, a lady got one of those Holy Ghost running fits. I don't know if you've ever seen those or not. They're, they're quite scary sometimes. But my, my grandmother called that shouting. And she'd get the little white hanky and she'd shout up and down the aisles. But, but this was one of those running fits. And she came around the back, she came down to the front, up down through the altar, and she run up right into my face and got right in my face. And she was just, she was speaking with language I, I, I don't know what it was. I'm not sure she, I'm sure she didn't. But she looked at me and stopped and said, you don't seem like you're enjoying this very much. <laughs> Is Jim Elliott still in the building? Jim carried her out. Uh, you remember that night, don't you, Jim? It scared this preacher to death. But uh, my, my point is, gifts are not given for the edification of individuals or the entertainment of others. They're given for the kingdom ministry. When gifts are given, we are to extend the ministry of Jesus into this present age. Just imagine that for a moment. That Jesus gives the church a gift so that you and I can do the work that He did and left us to do. I can't do that on my own. But through Him all things are possible. See, I can, I can love people that I couldn't love. I can embrace folks that I couldn't embrace. I can reach out to people that I don't even like. Because now I can do more than like them, I can love them. See, I can't do that on my own. But that's a gift that the Holy Spirit gives me. In 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, you get the whole list, you can read that. But what we learn, there are many gifts, there's one body, and those gifts are given by one Spirit for one common good. Powerful thought. Not everyone has all the gifts. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine the pride and arrogance that would come from somebody who had all the gifts? But I do have a dream. I've had this dream for many years. And my dream is to be the pastor of a church where all the gifts are operational. Can you imagine what that would do? Now, I know you're going to have a lot of folks leave. But a lot of folks left Jesus. Uh, but, but to do the work that Jesus has left us to do, there's a need for all the gifts to be operational. Now, uh, let me share with you a few dangers. 
when we get to the gift, there's, there's the danger of imitation. Watching others do it, I think I can do it. I, I remember it must have been a slow day because I was watching one of our televangelist friends and his wife. This was years ago, so you wouldn't have any idea who it was. And they did air condition a doghouse. But anyway, if, if that helps you any, just a hint. Uh, you got it figured out now? Okay. And, and they had a, a special guest on their show that day. And, and here's what they were going to do. They were going to teach the entire audience, probably an audience larger than this, how to speak in tongues. So we're going to teach you today how to receive the gift of tongues. And they went blow by blow, said, okay, well, I'm not going to tell you how, because that would be blasphemous. But, but they worked all, they worked for 15 or 20 minutes to coach people to speak in tongues. Now, now let me tell you, that's imitation at its worst. But, but we do that with all the gifts. We, we do it with prophecy and teaching. We, we, if we're not careful, we beat on tongues. But, but there are a lot of that. there's a lot of that going on. Uh, another is self-exhortation and elevating people. That was what was going on in the early church. They were exalting themselves. And people who had the greatest gifts were elevated to the highest places in the church. Hence, in 1 Corinthians 13. You familiar with 1 Corinthians 13? You hear it at weddings. And, uh, but it starts out what you don't hear at weddings. It starts out with this. Now, let me show you a more excellent way. He had just spent two chapters talking about tongues. Gifts of prophecy. Gifts of knowledge. The whole nine yards. And he says, now, let me show you a more excellent way. If I can do all things, and you know, I can speak with the tongues of angels, da-da-da-da, and have not love, I'm nothing. You see, so, so he, there, there's a greater gift, and there's a danger of pride and arrogance and fanaticism. I, I'll remind you of this that the very fires of revival are the same fires that cause wildfires. If they are done outside the bounds and the teaching of the Word of God, it will not be a revival. It will not be a revival fire. It will be a wildfire that burns everything it touches. So there's, there, there's certain things we need to remember with that. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, right in the middle of the Second Great Awakening. Excuse me, the First Great Awakening. He, uh, you, you've, you've never thought about Jonathan Edwards as being a spirit-filled preacher, right? When I talk about Jonathan Edwards, you think about him preaching hell so hot that men, grown men were hanging on to the lamppost. Because they just knew that God was after sinners, and they were sinners in the hands of an angry God. But uh, Jonathan Edwards was right in the middle of this great awakening, and, and he gave us a litmus test for the gifts. Listen to these and see if they resonate. First, does it honor Jesus? Does it honor Jesus? Does it produce a hatred for sin? Does it create a love for righteousness for Jesus and others? And finally, does it lead to truth? Now, I, I think I need to address the tongues for just a moment because you probably came to hear about that. Uh, just for your personal edification, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, six times in the book of Acts, uh, there's an account of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Six times. Three of those six mentions that they spoke with uh, an unknown tongue. 
The other three does not mention the baptism of the Holy Spirit leading to speaking in tongues. So we're 50-50, right? And you say, yeah, but how about the trump card? I'm not supposed to say trump in here. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know what to call it. Okay, how about the cherry on top? Let's call it that. Uh, how about Pentecost? That should, that should take the cake, shouldn't it? And I would say to you, absolutely not. Because that one's not even counted in the six. And the reason the gift on the day of Pentecost was not in the speaking, but in the hearing. It said every person heard them speaking in their own language. Sounds like a gift of hearing to me. And there was a purpose. Not all people who receive a baptism of the Holy Spirit speaks in tongues. You're welcome to disagree with me on that. Just my, I, that's my opinion for the day. Uh, this is not the evidence of being Spirit-filled. It is not the sign that one is a better Christian than someone else. Uh, I have a real good friend. Some of you would know him if I shared his name, which I won't do. But uh, he was my pastor at one point. He had the distinct spiritual gift to look you in the eyes and tell you that you're going to hell, and he had a smile on his face. Now that may not mean anything to you, but to me, that got my attention. I was going to hell, and my pastor was glad of it. That was scary. <laughs> but he had my attention. And he was the first pastor I can ever remember who spoke in our church about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First one I ever remember. And I'd graduated from that one room church. Now I'm going to a three-room church. See, I'm, I'm really moving up in the world. But he was the first pastor I ever heard that spoke of the infilling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's the first pastor I ever heard speak about sanctification and holiness. And I can tell you what our church did for him. Our church ran him off. His wife and his three children... And they were out of a job because they didn't like what he preached. We've got some pastors here that understands that. Now, the rest of the story is where I'm going. He started going to a church of another tradition. And he told me, he said, Terry, you know what? I'm, I went to the elders and told them that I wanted to be a pastor in their church. And I'd had 30 years experience and... God called me, and I felt like God had brought me to that church. And they said, well, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Oh, absolutely I have. Well, do you have the evidence of speaking in tongues? He said, no, I do not. And they said, well, sorry, sir, you do not qualify. Now, I don't know what this next statement means. He said, I went to lunch, and I came back after lunch, and I qualified I don't know what that meant. He's still alive, so God did not smitten him dead. But the point I'm trying to make for that is that if you're looking for an evidence that the Holy Spirit has filled your life and you're living a Spirit-filled life, don't, don't let something so human drive you away. You see... Paul clearly indicates that tongues are not the most important gift. Okay. Did you hear what I just said? Tongues are not the most important gift. Please don't go anywhere. Go, don't go running out of here and telling your Pentecostal friends that that district superintendent in the Mountain Lakes District doesn't believe in tongues. Because that's not what I said. I said the gift of tongues is not any greater it is not superior. It is not the single evidence that one's living the Spirit-filled life. Personally, when I read the Scripture, 
I find that I cannot dismiss the fact that tongues was a very powerful gift. And I cannot dismiss the fact today that it is still a gift. But I also have to temper that with this, that the reason the gift was given was to communicate the gospel to others who otherwise would not hear it. That's the purpose. Uh, tongues transcends language barriers as a way to communicate the gospel. That was the purpose for it. There is another tongues that's mentioned, and, and it's a tongues of a prayer language. Romans, don't hold me to this, but I think it's Romans chapter 8. No, yeah, Romans 8. That's a good chapter. Romans 8, verse 26. Listen to what it says. In the same way, the Spirit helps our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for. You ready for this? But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Now you can call that what you want. But that denotes that the prayer language of tongues is very, very accepted by the early church. Not everybody that prays, prays in tongues. But many do. There are some other stipulations. If you get the urge... Let's say, Michael, you get the urge Sunday morning and the Spirit comes over you and you're there at Fort Payne and you decide to give your entire 35-minute sermon in tongues. That'd be impressive. Word would circulate through Fort Payne quickly. But then someone who is an uh, astute Bible scholar would say, hey, that was illegal because no one interpreted it. If it is not interpreted, it does not extend the purpose of getting the message across. And, and to just throw in a, a, in the sermon a, a sentence of... I'm being kind today. Just throw in a sentence that makes no sense from some other Bible. That is not communicating the message. What that does, it communicates you not the message. Uh, so, so it's important for the interpretation is to be done orderly. Uh, concerning the gifts, I say one more time, seek the gift and allow Him to dispense the gift He chooses to use. For some reason, my stopwatch quit. It really did. I, I don't know what's happening. But I got to move forward. I, I can't stay here all day. I'd love to. This, this one area needs three weeks to talk about. But, uh, but we cannot regulate the gift of the Holy Spirit to a list of signs and wonders in a book. Uh, now, here's what I want to say. This is the... What time is this lesson supposed to end? What time? Oh, good. Good. I thought I'd... I've got 20 minutes. Now, this is what I want to... This is where I wanted this thing to come to. This is... I believe the part that we in the church need to live into. Listen to a couple of stories. Again... This fellow you may remember, his name's Will Willimon. You know, he's written over 60 books and 600 articles and, you know, you, you've heard that before. So anyway, in one of those, I want you to listen to what Bishop Willimon said. He said, one of the reasons why I have so much joy serving the United Methodist Church as a bishop is that my job gives me a front row seat to watch some of the Holy Spirit's most impressive work. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus and His continuing salvage operation in a fallen world. 
in dozens of little out of the way that's probably our district in, in, in dozens of little out of the way crossroads in Alabama I have seen the Holy Spirit calling forth and empowering otherwise ordinary folk that is our district ordinary folk to be a vanguard for his kingdom the work of the church is miraculous a God a living God's gifts accomplished through us that which we could not accomplish on our own folks that's revival happening and then uh, one more Peter Gregg who is part of the 24-7 prayer movement he says I see the Holy Spirit mobilizing the church in prayer on an unpre unpre unprecedented global scale I also see him reconciling historic divides between charismatics and evangelicals, between evangelism and justice ministries, and between marketplace and ministry. I see fresh innovation, new wineskins, new worship, new connections globally, and renewed confidence in the gospel flowing out of the developing world to provoke those of us wrestling with the challenge of post-Christendom. The Spirit is moving. And one more for you. This is Dr. Timothy Tennant again. He says the growth of the Pentecostal movement is probably one of the most remarkable historic developments of the 20th century. Given the fact that simultaneous Pentecostal revivals broke out in North America, Azuzu Street, in West Africa, Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, in parts of India, and of course, the Welsh revivals of 1904 and 1905. So within a five-year period, the world experienced a global explosion of renewal and vitality that has now mushroomed to over one billion new Christians. Can you think about that? Out of one movement, it has continued to flow down from that one billion believers. One of the revivals, the most remarkable revivals that I have heard of in our time took place in Wilmore, Kentucky. If you've ever been to Wilmore, Kentucky, it wouldn't even be a crossroads. Or it wasn't when I was there. Richard, it may have been less than that when you was there. But uh, Something happened in 1970 that shook the foundation of the country. It started in that little out-of-the-way place, in Wilmore, Kentucky. It started one day when a student stood up during chapel and shared his testimony. The speaker who was supposed to have spoken that day couldn't make it. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit works, isn't it? And this student stood up and shared his testimony. He confessed his sin. He confessed his uh, slackness in following the movement of God in his life. And he went to prayer. And something happened after that. And listen to one of the stories. I sat in the middle of a contemporary Pentecost. A few moments ago, there came a spontaneous movement of the Holy Spirit. The scene is unbelievable. The altar has been flooded with needy souls time and time again. Two and a half hours have passed. A joyous religion. Hands in the air, pointed toward God. He never fails. Seven hours have passed. A seminary yearns for God to move in the seminary. See, that's what you need to know. The college is on one side of the street. The seminary, which the college thinks is still lost, is on the other side of the street. So they said a student yearns for God to move in the seminary. There is a quiet yet peaceful spirit here right now. People are kneeling in the front of the, of the seats at Hughes Auditorium. 
exactly 26 hours have passed. The altar has just been flooded with souls. Deep repentance. Unusual spirit of holiness at this moment. 48 hours have passed. Almost 1,500 people in Hughes Auditorium. The altar is filled. 72 hours have passed. Revival is spread to the other Christian campuses. The revival is taking a national form. 106 hours have passed. 11.15 p.m., Seven to 800 people still in Hughes Auditorium. This is a very holy atmosphere. The result of that was word went out from that little hamlet in Wilmore, Kentucky that spread all over the world. It was because people confessed their sins, confessed their need to God, and cried out for the Holy Spirit to do something in their life that would change everything. And I've shared this with someone this morning. If we ask Jesus for the right things, we'll get them. And when we in the church have had enough, and we fall on our face, and cry out for the Holy Spirit to do something, and we're serious about it, we'll have revival. But I want to warn you. I want to warn you about something. We, we talk about wanting revival. Wanting revival. Wanting spirit birth revival. I had a friend that pastors, or he pastored one of those uh, charismatic churches in the town I served, and I loved him. Uh, Brother David was a man of God. And uh, we was in a ecumenical, that means that we're mixed up like stew, group of denominations. And, and we met at a, an old Methodist camp every week, and we prayed. Some prayed in tongues. Some of us Methodists just sit there scared to death. And uh, I mean, it was a, I mean, it was sort of one of those things. But, but one day we were all play, praying for revival, and Brother David said, Ho, oh, stop. He said, We keep asking for revival. I don't think we can stand revival. We couldn't stand it if God sent it. And I thought, what do you mean? That'd be wonderful. He said, no. When revival comes, it changes everything. Your priorities will change. Your jobs will change. Your home life will change. Your recreation will change. Your language will change. Your commitment to God will change. Your heart will change. I don't think we could stand revival. But church, if there's anything we need in our culture today, it's revival. Because we need to change. Now, now, now coming out of what I just shared with you, about that revival. The uh, president of the seminary at that time was Dr. Dennis Kenlaw. And Dr. Kenlaw's written a lot of books. Great, great teacher. Uh, uh, Dr. Kenlaw's a man of God. I mean, a deep man of God. He happened to be off the campus when all this broke. There's nothing like the pastor or the head shepherd being gone when something like that starts. And he got word that classes had been canceled. He thought, oh my goodness, i got to get back there. And he walked in to what was happening. And most of the book that Dr. Robert Coleman wrote, One Divine Moment, came from a statement that Dr. Kenlaw said. And this is what he said when he walked in. He said, give me one divine moment when God acts. And I say that moment is far superior to all the human efforts of man throughout the centuries. One divine moment when God acts. And folks, that brings revival. Uh, we have watched it spread 
And some of you have been a part of those movements. The Vineyard Movement by John uh, Wimber. The Brownsville Revival. The Toronto Blessing. The winds of revival in Africa and South America. Amazing things happen in our world today. We've gone from a global north religion to a global south religion. Today, the global church in the north, that's where we are, is dying. But yet, in the southern hemisphere, in Africa, rapidly becoming the largest contingent of Methodists in our denomination, in South America, in the Philippines, God is pouring out His Spirit in revival. Now, I'm, I'm going to bring this part to a close, but I want to say this. Uh, a friend of mine gave Don and I something for Christmas that I treasure. You've seen it on the screen. It's just a little block of uh, marble, and it says, Awaken. Awaken. I've talked a lot about Great Awakenings today. Every Great Awakening in Christian history has come after a Great Revival. Every single one. I named those revivals for you. But every revival came when God poured out His Holy Spirit on His people. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the revival fires, the great awakening that changed the face of the whole world. Now, I don't want to get the cart before the horse here, but... Today, I believe we're standing on the verge of the next great awakening. And I shared with you earlier, I'm praying that starts in St. Louis, Missouri, beginning on the 23rd day of February. Ricky got me thinking this way. He's going because he said... He couldn't stand the thoughts of revival breaking out and him not being there. I said, I'm going because the bishop said I had to go. So anyway, uh, you see, he's much more spiritual than I am. But he got me thinking, I've been praying the wrong way. Lord, don't, don't make those folks vote the way I want them to vote. Pour out your Holy Spirit and bring a new awakening to us. Amen. That revival will start again and reverse the trend of Methodism. Amen. Change the way we're going. Bring, bring that which is dead to life. One more time. And once we get to an awakening with God, all those things that are so insignificant will be burned up like chaff. Now here's the rest of that story. And then we're going to take a short break. The rest of that story is this. The next great awakening may just be the revival and the awakening that ushers in the kingdom of God. Now I don't know that for sure, but I know this. If it is, I want to be a part of it. I don't want to miss it. So I am praying that God will pour out His Spirit greater than the gifts, greater than, than anything else. He'll bring revival. He will bring His kingdom to the forefront in this present age. Foretaste of glory divine. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's a worthy reason to ask God to pour out His Spirit 
and let it begin with me. Father, we confess that we get caught up in a lot of stuff that in the grand scheme of things is going to return back to the dirt. But God, please, help us not to miss you. Please, Lord, do again what you've done before. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a break and we'll be back at uh, 2 for some worship and then the closing lesson.
Okay, let's uh, let's get to the good stuff. Uh, this is where we've been building toward all day. Uh, final lesson in this Holy Spirit conference, and I, I hope we've learned something. Uh, it'd be a waste of time if you came and spent all day and didn't learn something. But I, I, I hope we've learned something. At least, maybe been reminded of some things that the whole, about the Holy Spirit that we had forgotten. Uh, here is what we've learned from these lessons. I believe in repetition. The Holy Spirit is needed for us to become the people of God that God has destined His people to be and to accomplish His great plan. You've heard that before. The Holy Spirit is a person, not an it. Therefore, since God is a person, the Holy Spirit's a person, we can have a personal relationship with Him. The Holy Spirit is our conviction, our drawing to God, our teacher, abiding companion, source of power, purifier, and sanctifier. John calls Him the paraclete. Now, don't go tell somebody that the DS said the Holy Spirit was a parakeet. <laughs> I know how it'll come out. I'm scared already, Daryl. And please don't tell the bishop that. Uh, but anyway, uh, the paraclete is the comforter, the abiding presence with us, according to John. And we know now that the Holy Spirit, when poured out, in the fullness, gives us gifts uh, and extends the ministry of Jesus from the time He was on this earth until the place in the kingdom where we live. Uh, the Holy Spirit, when poured out, brings revival and awakening individually locally and globally. We come to the last lesson, the shortest of all. Somehow my watch, stopwatch, doesn't work. I must have wore out my phone. Okay. Okay, we're functioning. Uh, the question is, how do we receive the Holy Spirit? How do we receive the Holy Spirit? Uh, I want to get, begin with attempting to answer one challenge about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The debate, debate is always prevalent among a group of believers about when we receive the Holy Spirit. Right? You probably had that thought already today. Scripture is very clear that when we believe, when we repent and believe and are baptized, we receive all of the Holy Spirit that's available. The Holy Spirit does not divide Himself up a little bit here and a little bit there. Still, I'm reminded of a few texts that seems to conflict with that a little bit. One of those, Jesus is having a conversation with His disciples about His departure. This is in John 14, 17. He says, I am with you now, but I, the Spirit of truth, shall be in you. Okay, some folks debate that. A second one that I want to mention and this comes from Acts 19.2. Uh, scripture says, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Does this sound familiar? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And then the response was from the Ephesian Christians, No, no. We have not even heard of the Holy Spirit. Now, remind you, these were believers. Uh, 
The disciples, I think, were believers. Yet some doubted. We find out later. But, but Jesus made a promise. He was going to be with you, but later He was going to be in you. Now, in, in Acts chapter 11, at the Gentile Pentecost, they received water baptism after they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, that's illegal, isn't it? At least on the board of ministry that we preachers go through. That's not the way you're supposed to do this. You get saved. Well, yeah, I'm Methyl Baptocostal, so I'll use that word. You, you get saved. You get baptized. You get filled. But in that particular session, it was a little different. They had received water baptism and then spirit baptism. With that being said, I want to speak into that. Certainly, when we are saved, we have the Holy Spirit in our lives. Probably as much of the Holy Spirit as we will ever, ever have. So don't, don't throw anything at me yet. As was said earlier, the Holy Spirit doesn't divide Himself up in measures in itsy bitsy pieces. But the operative question is not, do we have all the Holy Spirit when we believe, as does the Holy Spirit have all of us? That's the operative question. Therefore, the fullness of the Spirit, to receive the fullness of the Spirit, we have to make room for Him by surrendering those areas in our lives that previously have been restricted to Him. Does that make sense? If not, let's try Wesley's example. Uh, Wesley often used this, and it's been used by Methodist followers ever since. But imagine, and I'm going to put this in my terms, not Wesley's terms. Okay? Imagine there's a house on a hill. Big house with a big porch. Big steps going up to it. Suddenly, Jesus walks up to the steps and comes to the front porch and knocks on the door. That's provenient grace. And then you recognize this stranger outside and you notice that the only way that your door can open, because it only has a bolt on your side... You have to open that door. And you invite Jesus in to your life. And you let Him come and stand in your beautiful foyer. And you say, Jesus, I'm glad you are now in my house. And Jesus looks around and says, It's good to be in your house. Could we go in that room? Oh, that's my living room. Yeah, come on. And you suddenly carry Jesus into your living room. And then he says, oh, I'm glad to be in your house. I've been in your foyer. I've never been in your living room. What's that room? Oh, oh, that's, that's, our, that's my dining room. That's where we eat. Can I go in your dining room? You think that might be a little forward up on Jesus' part. But you say, yeah, come on. And you invite Him into your dining room. And He goes by the bedroom. Even probably looks in the bathroom. And He says, it's sort of great joy to be in your house. But He stops at the foot of the stairs and just points. Could I go up there? Oh, oh, that's my playroom. Y you don't really want to go up there. I watch ball games up there, and man, I say some things sometimes that it may be stuck on the wall. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus, look, you got everything down here. Surely. And Jesus just says, mm-hmm. And He walks into your playroom. 
And then, just as Jesus would do, he says, what's in that closet? Say, please, Jesus. Mm -mm. No. That's all I've got left. It's mine. And Jesus says, mm hmm. And just when you think Jesus has everything, he says, What's that box over there in the corner? Looks like it's locked. What's in that? And now you're weeping. Surely not, Jesus. You don't want that. i got to have something left of me, right? And Jesus just reaches out His hand. And probably when you look at the nail scars, you're in tears. And He says, could I have the key, please? And you reach your hand in your pocket. And you give Him the key. Folks, that's the process of sanctification. Now, here's the rest of that story. Holy Spirit never has all of us strike that. We never have the actuality of the power of all of the Holy Spirit until we surrender everything unto Him. And that's the power, the effectual power of being filled with the Holy Spirit. The difference in the Spirit being with us in us being baptized in the Spirit is as much as taking a drink of water from a glass as opposed to being dropped from an airplane into the ocean. And folks, I've taken a lot of drinks of water from a lot of glasses. But it scares me to be dropped from an airplane into the middle of a spiritual ocean. That takes will. That takes surrender. That takes ultimate trust. For the early Methodist, there was always a physical response to the Spirit's drawing. But I want to quickly add, these responses were neither sought nor exalted. Still, the manifestations did not shock them or cause them to be fearful. One of the goals of this day, one of the goals of this conference was to bring back to the church something that had almost been lost. Check that off. Done. A second goal is to help us develop a language to talk to persons about the Holy Spirit. Done. Check that one off. Now the third and final goal of this day was to lead us to the moment of experiencing for ourselves the infilling, the fullness, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's all that's left. The premise for this is that everyone is meant to have that deep, intimate, power-filled encounter with the Holy Spirit. That was predestined for the foundation of the world. I want to try to use that language because God had a plan for us when this world was created that we would be transformed into His image. And the only way for that to happen is for His image to be poured into us. Now, some will always, when I bring that up, feel like the Ephesian believers. And so I have not, have never heard of the Holy Spirit. This raises the first obstacle for this afternoon. It's a feeling of shame and pride. Well, preacher, I've been in church all my life. I've been a leader in my church all my life. I've been singing in the choir since I was six years old. 
I've held every office in my church. But it's a difficult stretch to say that I've done all that on my own. It's shameful and prideful. But, but please do not allow something so human to block you from receiving something that has the possibility to change everything about your life from this moment forward. Something that has the propensity of empowering you to accomplish things for Jesus that you've never even had the courage to vocalize. A second thing that happens is fear. Fear. We're afraid that if we accept the infilling, the uh, baptism of the fullness of the Spirit, we might be made to do something weird. And you can fill in whatever you think that may be. But I promise you this, that God is not in the business of embarrassing His children. I had a good friend in a church on the other side of the state. He was not of my tradition. He was not a Methodist. As a matter of fact, right before I arrived, he went on the radio and told everyone in this little town that the Methodist church was an apostate organization because of our stance on baptism. In the name of Jesus, he told them. Uh, Right after I got there, he called me and said, could we have coffee? And I thought he was about to tell me I was an apostate. We went in, we were having our coffee, and I looked at him, and great big tears were pouring down his face. I mean, poor crocodile tears falling down to the table. I covered up my coffee. Uh, I mean, it was, it was bad for a grown man to be this broken up. He said, Pastor Terry, I need to tell you something. You don't know me well, if at all, but I need to apologize to you and your church because I said something about your church that was in error. I was so wrapped up in my denomination, in my tradition, that I didn't care who I hurt. But I need to apologize to you. I said, Brother, apology accepted, done, move forward. And he said, could I tell you what happened to me? I say, please, tell me what happened to you. He said, a few weeks ago, one of my members asked me to go to a city just up the road to a meeting that someone was leading who had been a part of the Brownsville, no, excuse me, the, Pen the Pensacola revival. And... Uh, he said, when I went in, I thought, man, I'm going to have to endure this. I don't believe this stuff. It's not a part of my tradition. Uh, just a bunch of hokey stuff. And, but he said, you know, when they came to the end and they asked people, do you want to be filled with spirit? The preacher walked out of the pulpit and walked straight up to me. He said, I was standing there and he looked in my eyes and said, young man, why are you so afraid? And here's the other part of that story before I move on. This young man, young man, had been hospitalized twice within the last three weeks of his life before this. Before he went to this revival, and he was told by the doctors that everything happened to him, happening to him was caused by his emotions. So the pastor or the preacher walks up to him and says, Young man, why are you so fearful? What are you afraid of? He said, Could I pray for you? I mean, what do you say? He reached out and laid his hands on him and said, Gracious Father, anoint and fill this brother with your Spirit. At that moment, my friend said, It scared me so bad because I was falling. 
and I couldn't stop. He said, I didn't fall in the floor, but I fell backwards on the pew. He said, God did a work in me. He's changed my heart. And I had to come and apologize to you. You see, he was being purified. And he was being filled with power. And he preached like he'd never preached before. And his church fired him. See, not everybody wants that much of the Holy Spirit. Can't take him, but in small amounts. But what God did with him, he's walked with him through some tough days since then, but he's pastoring one of the larger churches in that region now. Uh, but I'll never forget his words. Why are you so afraid? And I think that's a great question to ask the church this morning. Why are we so afraid of the renewing, transforming power of the Holy Spirit? A third thing happens, though, that prevents this. And that's that we feel so unworthy. Driving over here this morning, I'm glad I didn't have to drive all the way to Gaston for this. I'd have, I'd have melted before I got there. But uh, I, I felt it coming on for a few days. And uh, I sat down in this building earlier when the praise team started to, to sing and welcome the Holy Spirit in this place. In the midst of that worship, I was overcome by that. Because I said, God, I'm not worthy to stand and proclaim the day what I'm going to say. You ever feel that way? That, that you're not worthy for the gift that God wants to give you? The only illustration I got for that is I did not give my children gifts because they're worthy. You know why I gave them gifts? I gave them gifts because they were my children. And I love them. Now to how. Carolyn Moore, this will not be on the screen, but Carolyn Moore, after she had talked about what happened to her uh, in Evans, Georgia, when she was invited to the Western Sizzlin for a breakfast one morning and got prayed for to receive the Holy Spirit at... Uh, no, it was not. It was at the Golden Corral. Let me get it correct. And she said the last thing she remembers is hitting the floor thinking, this is a nasty carpet I'm about to hit. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, This is what she said. She said this at, uh, at Seedbed in the upper, at the New Room Conference. She said, We do not receive the gift of the Holy Spirit by just simply watching TV. Oh, it is on the screen. We simply have to give ourselves to the work of Jesus and believe that the Spirit will show up. Did you hear that? It's not going to happen by us just going our everyday way. Very intentionally, we give ourselves to Jesus and believe that the Spirit will show up. Sisters and brothers, I love you. I really do. And I want you to hear this. I encourage you to passionately seek and ask God for the gift. The Holy Spirit is the gift. I ask you to surrender yourself, your whole self, to Him. Thirdly, by the faith you have. Did you hear that? By the faith you have, receive that gift. Do not allow the evil one 
to steal by doubt or fear what God has given by grace. Give yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit and believe He will do what He said He would do. I have four minutes to share with you my testimony and this may be the one that gets me fired. Uh, I was uh, 19 years old. Don and I had been married one year. Uh, we'd given our hearts to Jesus. And we were baptized in a cow pond together, and I'm not supposed to tell you this, but she was rebaptized. I'm not supposed to tell you that, but she was. And uh, we were baptized together in that cow pond and started to serve. And I mean, I had my place. I said, I always sat on the back, second row from the back on the preacher's left. That was my seat. And I, I, I took care of my seat. I, I love setting that far away. I wasn't in danger. Uh, but that preacher, the same one that told me that I was going to go to hell and then laughed, he came to me one day and said, Hey, I don't think you have to be 21 years old to be a lay leader in the church. How about being a lay leader? I said, Oh, yeah. Had not a clue. <laughs> I could, he might as well be talking about President of the United States. I had no idea. And then he came to me one day, and it got more difficult. He said, how about joining a 40-day Wesley prayer experience with me and a few others? I said, well, oh, oh, I'll have to pray about that. And he says, no, you don't. You know that's what Jesus has called you to do. I said, oh, okay, if you say so. And it got more difficult. He said, would you uh, be a liturgist? On Sunday morning? I said, what's that? He said, well, that's somebody that stands up before the congregation and reads. and You might say a prayer. And I said, say a prayer in public? He didn't realize I was so shy, I wouldn't even talk to my mother-in-law for about five or six weeks after I met her. And then after that, she wished I'd never said anything. But <laughs> still, I mean, she thought I didn't like her because I was so shy. I couldn't speak to anybody. Terrible inferiority complex and paranoid, and you just name it. And he wanted me to stand up and pray and read the Scripture before God and everybody? I don't think so. And then one day he came and said, Well, you can do this. I want to start a visitation program. How about going with me and knocking on some doors? And I said, And doing what? Telling people about Jesus. I said, oh, no, no. I, I don't think I can do that. But there was one thing I was doing pretty well. You see, over those 17, 18 months from the time I was baptized, uh, I was slipping back the other direction. I wasn't moving forward in Jesus. I was moving the other way. So one night we had this movie that they brought a movie in that was literally there to scare the hell out of everybody because the name of it was The Burning Hell. Ricky, you showing that tomorrow for your sermon? Uh, but anyway, uh, they, they were going to just scare, if there was any hellacious activity in us, they were going to scare it out. They were going to get everybody saved. Well, I knew I was already saved. Thanks be unto God. So they gave the invitation. And I'm sitting back there, look at all these people going out there and getting saved. That's a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. I wish they'd hurry up. Uh, but you know, I'm good, I'm good. And then that sneaky preacher, that sneaky preacher, he had already said this is going to be the last verse of Amazing Grace sung for the last time. And he said, oh, Lord's leading me. Sing one more verse. And I'm thinking, oh, I wish you'd hurry up. He said, God's put it upon my heart, the Holy Spirit has, that there's somebody here, they're already a Christian. They've already prayed the sinner's prayer. They're, they're already in the kingdom. But they have no power to live the Christian life. I said, oh, that sounds a little bit familiar. And we're going to sing one more time.
And he'd already said that once. So I, I said, well, let's test him. Knowing what God was doing and the Holy Spirit was burdening my soul. He said, at the end of that verse, and I'd already told God, I said, God, if there's one more verse, I'll go down. And we'd already done 49 verses of just as I am. And, and, I, and I'm back there and I'm thinking, oh, Lord. And then this is what he said. He said, someone here needs to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the calling on their life. And that scared me because I didn't know there was a calling on the life. But he said, we're going to sing one more verse. I said, uh-oh. And growing up to fear God more than uh, anything else, and I'd already made a deal with God, I went, I said, okay, God, this is me. I took the first step. The rest of the time, I don't remember. But when I got down to the altar, He prayed over me. And uh, He prayed that God would pour out His fire upon me. That scared me. And, and what really scared me, there was something went through my body. This is what gets you fired as a pastor. It was like a bolt of lightning from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Something happened. And I left there that night. I didn't speak in tongues that night. But some other things happened. I hated my job. I didn't like the people I worked with. It, the place stunk. This wasn't even the bullet factory. And I went in. And, and you know what? That place looked different. The people I worked with were different. I started to notice that about a lot of things in my life. And what happened there at that altar, God didn't change the surroundings around me. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He changed to me. And the rest of that story is pretty simple. A few months later, before he was run off from that church, he whispered in Diane's ear something that I wasn't supposed to hear. He said, Diane, I said, Hun, when Terry goes in the ministry, you call and let me know. He said, Yes. And that prevented me for about six months because I didn't want him to call me in the ministry. But I'd been fighting it and fighting it. But here's what I'll tell you the truth is I could never, ever, ever have accepted the call to ministry until I opened up my heart and life for the Holy Spirit to have His way. Thanks be unto God that some preacher had the courage to look me in the eye and challenge me in the name of the Holy Spirit. So congregations don't fire you, preacher. Embrace them and love them for telling you the truth. Now we're to the point of an invitation. Um, there is no prescribed way to do this. No f response that's adequate, I mean, that you have to do. There's nothing expected out of you. We're not saying you need to fall down on the floor. You may fall on the floor. You may not. Carpet's clean here. Uh, we're not saying you need to speak in tongues. Mm -mm. That's, remember, that's not the sign. The only thing that I'm asking you is somebody that loves you. Have you opened up your entire life for the Holy Spirit to take control of. Do you want the joy, the peace, the transformation that comes from what He offers those who love Him and commit themselves to Him? The way that happened in... I know I've gone over a little bit. 
But the way that happened in Franklin, Tennessee, it was different for every person. That was the beauty of it. Some received the power of the Holy Spirit just sitting there in their pew. Some felt they needed to find a a place of solitude and pray. Others needed someone sitting next to them there in in those chairs to reach over and agree with them. Some needed to go to an altar. And some needed to be anointed with oil. The only thing I ask you to do is do what God tells you to do. And that's enough. That's always enough. I'm about to have a short prayer. The praise team is going to sing. We have pastors here. Uh, If you'd like one of these pastors to pray, Mike is over here, Ricky, Paul. I I see folks all all over the building. Uh, Gene's back here. Mark's still here. All right, he's the man with the oil. Uh, if, if you would like to be anointed and prayed for for this anointing, Mark's the man. He's got the oil. He's already anointed me this morning or this earlier. So I, I just simply ask you as the praise team sings, just open up and bathe. Soak in the power of the Holy Spirit just like a pickle. And I'll promise you, when you soak, God will just overcome and overwhelm you. Lord, we are so unworthy. And God, we know we've experienced you numerous times. We believe in a second work of grace, but we believe in a 30th work of grace. We need you now more than we've ever needed you to do the work of ministry, to have healthy marriages, uh, to have victory over those things that beset us, to recover the joy and to love people that we can't love on our own. God, rain down your Holy Spirit. 